Lord, just super excited to look into your word right now, Lord, and learn something new from you and about you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Yeah. How's everybody doing? I know, how come everybody's so like amped up? It was supposed to be like the post, you know, nap. Oh crap, Dane's speaking before dinner. Like, how am I gonna stay awake? Oh, uh, everybody went surfing. Oh yeah, that would that would be adrenaline rush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I've kind of been in the four o'clock slot, and then same thing on Friday. I, I got uh, eleven and four on Friday. Um, miércoles. It does miércoles. Only miracle is milagro. Twice on Friday. Woo! Yeah! Boo! Yeah! Some TBDs, yeah? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, no, not going to happen, but whatever. <laughs> okay, so last time we got together, the apostles had their first go out without Jesus. He has them go out in a way that causes them to have to depend on God and to protect them from the temptations of power and riches. And um, King Herod hears about what's going on. He gets a little nervous. That was just kind of a weird little... Inter, inter, interlude there. We really didn't, we didn't learn much from that. But we had more of a good teaching about faith with um, Jesus feeding the 5,000. But tonight, I notice I said tonight, I guess it is night, yeah, 4 p.m. Tonight, um, we sort of have another big reveal about Jesus that has consequences for us. So we're in the book of Luke. Turn to chapter 9, and let's just read verse 18. Once, when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him. Is that an oxymoron? Uh-huh. Isn't that weird? I thought he was praying privately. I, the only thing I can guess from that is maybe they were, they were used to having so many people around all the time that, right, when it was just the disciples, it was like, oh, finally, we're alone. I don't know. It's just weird. Like, Jesus was praying well, in private. Alone outside the tent and then his disciples. Came in. Yeah, it's possible. I don't know. It's just weird, Yeah. And his disciples were with him, and he asked them, hmm, who do the crowd say I am? Now, can I just pause there for a second? Just like, because I always like to work these things out on my head. What I wrote in my notes was, do um, you wonder if, like, God the Father said, hey, bud, son, son, I think it's time, right? I mean, because he's praying in private, and all of a sudden, he stops praying, and he goes, who do the crowds uh, say I am? Like, right? Like, where did that come from? I'm wondering if, like, God the Father was like, all right, your time has come. It's time to you for you to have a discussion. Now, he says, um, who do the crowds say that I am? It really means who do the people say I am. But um, this is interesting because they had just asked themselves, remember with the miracle of the, um, the miracle of the calming of the storm after Jesus tells the wind to stop and then he tells the waves to lay flat? And what do they say? Who is this that commands wind and the waters obey him, right? King Herod has just asked, who is this that I'm hearing about? And the Pharisees have asked, who can forgive sins but God? And so Jesus is speaking to what is on everybody's mind, who is this guy, right? So who do the crowds say I am? Now, um, imagine the evidence that they have so far before them. So let's see if you guys, I mean... Maybe it's confusing for you guys because you're in the book of Luke, you're in the book of John, but just roughly, what evidence might they have before them right now regarding who he is? What's happened so far? Miracles. Miracles? We could go way back to the first miracle, the miracle of his birth, right? A virgin, a virgin with child, right? And then the whole Christmas story thing with the stars and the wise men and Bethlehem and everything like that. Zechariah, I remember losing his voice and declaring, finally coming out, um, all that. What else has he done? Feeding 5,000. There's a miracle. What else has he done? Yes, Madison. Isn't it, doesn't it kind of go back to the man being sent up into the desert to proclaim the Exactly. That's more answered prophecy. The voice in the desert calling, which would be, you know, prophetic about John the Baptist, right? Good. Somebody else over here? Yeah. Uh, he hasn't sinned yet. Yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> that would be a small, important detail. No evidence of sin in his life. Excellent point. That was really good, actually. Yeah. Yes, Kate. Yeah, that's a big one. Thank you. I was hoping somebody would bring that up. Bringing a girl, bringing Talitha Kum. Remember, little girl, I say to you, get up. 
He brought her back from the dead. Actually, two now. Didn't he raise a boy as well, yeah? Raised a boy from the dead and a girl from the dead. Yeah, small little indicators, perhaps, who he might be. So what I wrote in my notes was this. All the miracles around his birth, the prophecies that he's fulfilled, like, you know, he'll come out of um, Bethlehem. Um, Power over nature. There's a big one, right? Power over demons. Remember how he casts out demons without even a second thought, yeah? Yeah. Power over illness and power over life and death, right? So he's going to ask him two questions. The first one is, who do the crowds say I am? And look how they answer in verse 19. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. Now, there's not really a lot to read into these um, responses. I don't have a lot to say about them. They're kind of self-explanatory. Herod, at this point, has put John the Baptist to dead, so it would be like a resurrected John the Baptist, um, or one of the powerful prophets, yeah? Um, Okay, so what I want to ask you guys right now is, in your peer group, or maybe not even in your peer group, but in your life, who do people say Jesus is? People, people, especially like unbelievers, your friends, your family members, who do they think Jesus is? Raise your hand, then we'll go one to one. Yes, Kate. I have a friend who thinks Jesus is a joke. Uh, he thinks Jesus is a joke? He's very, um, she sees him as very, like, what's the word? Like, put together in the comedic way, like, he's too, like, good in futures kind of thing. Like, made up, perhaps? Well, Okay. But does she recognize him as an actual historical figure? Mm. You don't know. Maybe you never asked her that. I think she knows he's real, but I don't think she recognizes him. Is deity. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. Anybody else? Yes. Chance. I was going to say kind of the same thing. Like my brother said, he's just like a prophet. Like a mm-hmm. prophet. Like a prophet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that he was just a regular That's good. That's good. Because that's one of the answers he has right here. Some say he's a prophet. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Keely. What's that? Just a good guy. Yeah, a good guy. Um, can, I, can I expand on that for a second? A good moral teacher. Have you ever heard that? Well, I believe, you know, he taught good morals and things, yeah? So I made my own little list of here. Um, a good moral teacher. I've heard people say, well, he was an enlightened being, you know, like maybe like... Most enlightened being. Yeah, most enlightened being, yeah. Uh, some have called him a political dissident, yeah? Um, how about like an avatar? <laughs> Or like an alien, maybe a space alien. Here's one. How about like a cult leader? You know, like cult leaders like David Koresh? You guys remember David Koresh? Probably not, but whatever, yeah. Who's the modern-day cult leader? Oh, the, um, what is it, the Christian science guys. What's Tom Cruise in? Scientology. Scientology, yeah, like L. Ron Hubbard. Maybe like, an old, like an, the original L. Ron Hubbard or something, right? And then to, yeah, there you go, yeah. We, we won't go there, but yes. Um, and then to Keliana's point, how about just a really charismatic but slightly deluded carpenter's son? You know, just like a cult leader, a guy who kind of had, was really smart and got a little bit too carried away. And a lot of people kind of think that's who Jesus was, like a really good guy, good moral teacher. He was maybe like, maybe a genius, maybe too smart for his own good. And then he kind of got this thing going that got out of control and it ended up with him getting executed for his trouble, right? Okay, I just want to submit to you that, just so you know, when you read the scriptures the way the scriptures tells it, it's anything but that. Because, in fact, we're going to see it today. If anything, what the scriptures teaches us is he was planning his, resurre- his crucifixion pretty much from day one. Like, he is actually orchestrating the events around to ensure that he actually gets crucified. And he actually ends up getting crucified right on the Passover when the Passover lamb should be getting sacrificed. He times the whole thing. So far from a guy that just kind of let things get out of control, it's just the opposite. Scripture speaks about him being completely in control. Okay, so then Jesus turns the tables on them. Verse 20. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Now, I love the fact that Peter answered, the Christ of God. 
I don't know, but I'm going to guess, and I hope we get to see it someday. Like, you know, we get to heaven and they have, like, the actual chosen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, we get to go to the, have you ever been to Disneyland? They have the Disneyland theater. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great you're in heaven and there's, like, the heaven theater? <laughs> you're like, yeah. Hey, I want to, no? Yeah, I want, I, want to, I want to, like, see what actually happened. Because what I envision happening right here is Jesus looks to everybody. By the way, it's not just the apostles. All the women are there. So it's got to be 25, 30 people there, right? And Jesus goes, who do you say I am? And what I picture is everybody going. And everybody looking at Peter like, come on, Peter. Because Peter's the one who's always going to open his big fat mouth, right? And so Peter, I kind of envision him kind of going, uh, uh. And then he just says it, right? What I want you to do, um, actually, no, we're, I thought I was going to have you turn there. Uh, no, that comes up later. Okay, I'm going to read you um, the Matthew version from Matthew 16. He answers, the Christ, son of the living God, okay? Which is much bigger than what it says here in the book of Luke. He says, the Christ, son of the living God. And in the Matthew version, Jesus actually replies, and this is important for our study, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, which is Peter, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. So Peter calls him the Christ, which from the Christos is actually another title for the Messiah. So at this point, sort of like cats out of the bag. Everybody's been wondering, is this the Messiah? Because remember, everybody at this time was sort of supposed to be waiting for the Messiah also known as the anointed one. And this is the one expected. Remember when John the Baptist had his moment of doubt? He says, are you the one we have been what? Expecting, yeah, waiting. Are you the expected one? So the reason why I say all this is everything's getting really narrow in the definition. Does that make sense? Way different than maybe just a prophet, maybe just a really religious guy. Yeah, yeah, who is this guy? The Messiah. Okay, now what's interesting is that from this moment forward, as we go through the book of Luke, Jesus is going to be much more clear about who he is and what's going to happen. Does that make sense? Like up to this point, he's just been this really kind of amazing guy with great teaching. Everybody's sort of been on board when he's like, you know, don't listen to those legalistic Pharisees, but instead I want you to, you know, love of people. I want you to take care of the poor. The kingdom of heaven is open for anybody. It's open even for tax collectors, for women of ill repute. You are accepted by God. But so far, he's been super tight-lipped about what's he doing here? Like, what's the purpose of him being here? And that, everything's going to change right now. Okay, so from this point forward, he's going to be much more clear about that. And um, he's going to actually explain right now what's going to happen. I want to point out to you, however, even though he's going to explain what's going to happen, um, they're still not going to fully get it until Pentecost, which is actually after the death, after the resurrection, and after Jesus ascends and go back to he goes up, back to heaven, goes up to heaven, yeah. And even Jesus himself says, when I go, I will send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he says, who will remind you, get it, of all these things I'm teaching you. Now, the reason I say that, it's going to come up later tonight, is Jesus is going to predict his death a whole bunch of times, and people really still aren't going to get it. In fact, in the book of um, Matthew, there is a slow acceptance of, um, of what they say. But I'm getting sort of ahead of myself. So right now, he's just... Peter says, you're the Messiah, and, and, and Jesus says basically, yes, well done. And Peter enjoys his little, very brief moment being right. of being right. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a very, very brief moment, as we're going to see in just a second. So Peter's probably right at this moment. Can we just enjoy Peter's moment while he pats himself on the back? Yeah, I got it right. I got it right. Got it right. Because everybody looks at Peter. Peter's like, oh, the Messiah. And Jesus is like, yes. And blessed are you, Simon, for this was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And Simon's probably going, damn straight. Yeah, what did you do? Yeah. Go me. Yeah, okay. So verse 21. Now, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And that kind of begs the question, why is that? Aren't they supposed to be evangelists? 
Well, quite frankly, no, <laughs> not right now. Very likely the reason why is for this, there's no sense having them go out, explain to everybody until the gospel is complete. After the resurrection, now you should go tell everybody. One of the main reasons this might be is because at this point, they still have no clue what the plan is. Does that make sense? All they know is they're cruising with the Messiah, but he's like, just keep that under your hat right now. Because you guys, they don't even know enough. Like, what do they know? I, they know just enough to do damage. What's that old saying? He knows just enough to be a, a threat. Anyway, something like that. Okay. Oh, in fact, if anything, let me read you these um, notes from my NIV Life Application Bible. I thought this was good. Just enough, to be just enough to be dangerous. Right. Jesus told his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ because at this point they don't fully understand the significance of that confession. Nor would anyone else. Everyone still expected the Messiah was going to come as a conquering king. But even though Jesus was the Messiah, he still had to suffer, be rejected by the leaders, be killed, and rise from the dead. When the disciples saw all this happen to Jesus, they would understand what the Messiah had come to do. And only then would they be equipped to share the gospel around the world. So, in fact, speaking of, let's go right, excuse me, right there. Verse 22. Now, this must have blown their minds a little bit. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Now, if you're reading that right now and you're going, uh-huh, yeah, uh -huh. can you please stop for a second and put yourself in their shoes for a second? Because this would have blown their minds. Do you understand? They've been waiting for a Messiah to come who's going to do what? Anybody know? Yeah, take, take, conquer Rome, kick Rome's butt. He's going to reestablish the kingdom of David, right? The second coming of David. The Messiah, the, the, Messiah, the Messiah is supposed to come and like set up an army. And by the way, it wouldn't just be a military conquering. It would also be a religious revival. He was going to come and he was going to straighten out the crooked priests that everybody knew was busy ripping everybody off at the temple because we haven't got there yet, but that's what was happening at the temple, right? They were ripping off people, doing that weird money exchange thing. The Messiah was going to come and he was going to reestablish correct religion and he was going to kick the Romans' butt and then they were going to reconquer all the land that they had lost and that was what was supposed to happen. Now the Messiah is here and everybody's like, yes. I knew it. I knew he was the Messiah. And then he goes and says, and so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get rejected. I'm going to suffer. And I'm going to get put to death. Now, what I wonder is um, if anybody even heard the whole part about resurrection or if that went completely over their heads. And I think it did. So it gives, he gives a lot of information in a very short sentence, right? You're going to be rejected. Then you're going to be killed. This is not what they're expecting of this great Messiah and this great prophet. Again, I don't think anybody ever heard when he said on the third day he'll be raised again. In fact, um, one of the best Easter sermons um, I ever heard was the pastor got up and what he did was he read every passage in the four gospels where Jesus says, and on the third day he will be raised from the dead. And it, it's like 15 times or something. It's like he tells them over and over and over. And yet, as we all know the story, because we've all sat through a million Easter's in our lives, right? On the day he's resurrected, people are shocked. People are like, no way, no way. He rose from the dead, right? So what I'm wondering right now is, is anybody even heard him say that on the third day he will be raised to life? I don't think they heard even that far. I think all they heard him say was, he's gonna be killed. And they're like, hey, what? Because that's not what's supposed to happen, okay? So let's go to Mark chapter 8, because I want to show you the part that Luke doesn't cover, because it's classic, because it's classic Peter. Ma uh, Mark, go to Mark chapter 8, let's go to verse 31. So again, um, by the way, this whole thing is titled The First Prediction of His Death. Because in Matthew, I think there's at least three, and some of the other Gospels might be more, I don't, more or less, I don't remember the count exactly. But Mark and Luke talk about this same incident here. This is virtually the same incident with more information. So Mark, uh, Mark 8, 31 to 33. 
He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days raise again, rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and you've got to love this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Wah, 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 wah. Poor Peter. Remember Peter, like not but five minutes ago, was like the star? Got it right? Who do you say that I am? I say you're the Messiah. Well done, Peter. My heavenly Father revealed that to you. And here we are, like not but 30 seconds later or so. Get thee behind me, Satan. Do it. Okay. Well, what is going on here? Uh, in fact, um, in Matthew, Peter says, Peter says this in Matthew, God, God forbid it, Lord. May it never happen. God forbid it. Get it? Yeah, yeah. So Peter has a twofold faux pas here. First of all, by rebuking Jesus, I wrote in my notes, he has the flow chart of authority wrong. <laughs> what do I mean by that? He's yeah. <laughs> Who the heck does Peter think he is to tell Jesus what is going to or what is not going to happen, right? Yeah, or what should or shouldn't happen. Now, Peter, bless his heart, is probably thinking he's being helpful, right? But boy, does he have it wrong, okay? And then, um, um, but more importantly, yeah, and I believe this is why he gets such a harsh rebuke from Jesus, is he is suggesting a path that contradicts the redemptive purpose of God. Because Peter doesn't have in mind God's redemptive plan. He has in mind the things of men. So we'll get to that in just a second here. But what I love about this, uh, if you go back to, um, actually, it's still in Mark. I like the way it says, Jesus looked at his disciples. And this tells me that his rebuke of Peter wasn't just so much to shut down Peter. As much as he was instructing all the disciples in other words, it was likely that all the disciples were thinking the same thing Peter was thinking. Killed? No, 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 no. That's not how the whole Messiah thing works. They just don't have the cojones to say it. Only Peter will open his mouth and go, no, 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 no. I think you got it wrong. But my guess is all of the people were thinking Jesus had it wrong, right? Here's why it's interesting. And why does Jesus say, get thee behind me, Satan? Because that's what Satan wants to do. Satan not only wants to frustrate God's redemptive purpose, but Satan also wants to promote the things of men, which would be material wealth, pride, and power. Now, was that an issue with some of the apostles, power, wealth, and pride? I'd say yes. Remember, remember when, um, yeah, Kate's okay, like, oh, no, not the apostles. They're too pure. Remember when um, James and John's mom comes to Jesus, and she's like, could my boys sit at your right hand when you come into your kingdom, right? Like, they're like jockeying for position, and he's not even dead yet, right? And that's the things of men. And so these guys, and I don't think it was just Peter, I think it was all of them, were excited when Jesus says he's the Messiah, because think about it. If Jesus is the Messiah, and at this point, I don't know how long we're into it, let's just guess a year, right? They've been walking around for a year, camping with the Messiah. They're like on first names basis with the Messiah. He's even got nicknames for them, right? They're like super tight. Yo, Jesus, my man, my homie, right? And now he's the Messiah. I wonder what was going through their minds if they're thinking, hey, this could work out really well for me. And Jesus says, okay, you got it. I'm the Messiah. Here's what's going to Happen. I'm going to get killed. And I bet you every single one of them was like, hang on a second. That's not what I had in mind. And so Jesus looks at all of them and he says, you have in mind the things of men, not the things of God. And this better sets up the whole rest of the teaching in Luke. So go back to Luke chapter 9 and we'll see what happens next. Okay, because what he's going to do now is set up the opposite of worldly wealth and power. So let's read uh, 9, 23, and 24. Then he said to them all, If anyone will come after me, 
he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. Now, what I want to get across to you today is you're, most of you are familiar with that verse, right? Take up your cross and follow me. But what I want you to remember for the rest of your lives is that verse doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs right after Jesus has predicted his death and everybody was like, no, 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 no. Because what Jesus is saying this, Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to go lay my life down, right? And if you're going to follow me, guess what's going to be required of you? Anybody? Lay your life down, right? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In fact, I got off my notes a little bit here. Oh, by the way, it's interesting, too, that Jesus says, um, take up his cross. Um, I want to just say this. We all have it so stuck in our heads that Jesus is going to die on a cross. We naturally assume that, of course, if Jesus is going to be killed, he's going to be crucified. But it's really interesting because not necessarily. There's a lot of different ways for people to get killed. You ever see that movie, A Million Ways to Die in the West, or whatever that was? No? I never saw it. I'm a Christian. But you saw it, Sam? Good job. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Great movie, yeah. But remember, people got put to the sword. Uh, what was the Jewish way of killing somebody? Stoning, right? And that would be a typical death for blaspheming. Now, I know they weren't technically allowed to stone people to death under Rome, but I'm sure they did. But it's interesting, Jesus goes right to the cross. And by the way, i got to say this. I was watching an old episode of The Chosen last week, and I kind of felt like they stole my thunder, my teaching, because I've been teaching this for years. It's something that Christians don't think about very often. But there was this episode in The Chosen where Jesus goes up to Jerusalem to do the healing at the pool of Bethesda. You know what I'm talking about when he heals the... the and in the, in, the, in the scene out of The Chosen, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus walks by three guys being crucified. And Jesus kind of like pauses and looks at the crosses and kind of makes a face like, right? And we all know what he's thinking, right? We all know what he's thinking, right? But think about it. Did you ever think about that? that Jesus has seen multiple people being crucified in his life. We tend to think, because in Sunday school they don't teach stuff like that, we tend to think like Jesus was like the one-off, you know, the one guy. And then we know that the two thieves or whatever, but we kind of think about the story of Jesus as three guys getting crucified. But if you've ever read the history of Jerusalem, they were crucifying people daily. It was like a super common thing. You'd walk along the roads, and that's where they put robbers and highwaymen and anybody that raised a fist against Rome, and there was lots of them, yeah? And when they would have like a, um, like a what do you call it, um, a rebellion against Rome, they might crucify a couple hundred people. Think about that. A couple hundred people and line the roadway with them, right? We never think about that, but Jesus walks by crucified people probably um, on a regular basis. Okay, so just so you know, um, I thought I had the Greek on this, but maybe I don't. Hmm. And that's something, okay, to Lexi's point, can you imagine if you're just a normal person? But here's the thing. That was daily life, I think, for a lot of people. One thing when I read that book, um, uh, Biography of Jerusalem, that's when it really struck me what a violent period of time this was. That growing up, if you were to grow up in the time of Jesus in a village around there, it's very likely you witnessed a lot of death, like a lot of people being killed. It was just a much more violent time than we have right now. It's kind of radical to think about. We, yeah. What's that? That was what their sport was. Yeah, they, they, made, they made sport of it. You know, I mean, shortly after, in about, within about 100 years of the time we're looking at right now, they were putting Christians to death in the Colosseum in Rome using lions and all kinds of, you know, torches and all kinds of fun ways. And they had stadiums full of people watching people get basically tortured to death. So it's... It's a heavy-duty time. So listen, when Jesus says this, you must deny himself and take up his cross daily. Just so you know, um, don't confuse deny self with what we call asceticism, which is where you make a practice of simply denying yourself all pleasure. That's not really what that means. Um, asceticism is the practice of strict self-denial as a measure of personal 
and especially spiritual discipline, vigorous abstention from self-indulgence. What it, indulgence, what it really means when it says pick up um, your cross daily is to die to yourself and your fleshly desires that are not of God and to live for other people instead. Um, Romans chapter 6 says this, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, Jesus, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And when it says the body of sin is done away with, I know I've taught this to you before, and I'm probably going to teach it to you four more times, or until you finally say, we get it, Dane, we get it, stop teaching this. But it's a really interesting verse in Romans 6, when it says your fleshly nature has been done away with, it does not mean removed, it means rendered powerless. The reason why that's so important is because every one of us in this room carries with us a sinful nature. Paul calls it the outer man who is decaying. And we have an inner man, which is our rejuvenated, our regenerated spirit that is slowly but surely gaining power over our sinful nature that as we grow and mature, we become more righteous. Okay, does that make sense? Romans 6.6. 6. It's worth underlining done away with and make a little note in your margin rendered powerless. Because otherwise, why, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be tempted. We wouldn't have a sinful nature. We would all just living, be living super righteous lives, which is not really my daily experience, right? So that helps explain why, even though I'm now a believer, I still sin. Does that make sense? Because if I didn't have a sinful nature, I probably wouldn't be sinning. Does that make sense? Yeah? But we still have a sinful nature. The difference is now we have power. Okay, it's a huge difference. Okay, verse 25. We're almost done. Wow. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his very self? This is kind of a self-explanatory verse. I think it gets kicked around a lot. You guys are probably super familiar with it, yeah? Um, What I want to point out to you, though, is that um, I I like the way it's translated self, right? Um, What good is it for man to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his very self? Because the word isn't life. It's not, you know, zeo or whatever. But it really is self. And... um, Oh, I think I'll just stop right there. Okay, I was going to tell you a very brief story about that. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his very um, self? I think we all understand it's worth nothing, right? Because everything on this planet fades away. There's no joy or peace from having stuff, right? I think that's a basic Christian teaching that most of you have probably heard you understand and maybe go to different levels of it. But I thought I'd tell you a funny story. Um, one time, uh, I was over visiting uh, my parents with my family when my kids were like babies. And so there was me, my wife, and Cozy and Nakia, and they were probably toddlers. And I remember um, the, the lottery, what is it, the Powerball, was like $100 million or something like that, right? And so we had stopped at a 7-Eleven for some reason, and I bought $5 worth of lottery tickets, right? You know, Powerball lottery tickets. And so I'll never forget that night. It was the night of the lottery draw, and I was in bed, and I had, I don't know, I had not like I had checked my numbers. And I actually started thinking about, I wonder what my life would be like if I won the lottery. Like, what would my life be like if I won $100 million? And not like, oh, wow, I could buy a cool car. But no, I actually did the math. Like, what would my life actually be like? And then I tried to envision like coming here home to Kauai and I'd probably be on the front page of the Garden Island, right? Uh, Kaloa man wins a hundred million dollars. Pastor of Kauai Christian (laughs) Fellowship wins a hundred million dollars. And I began to actually do the math like what that might look like in my life. And you know what I realized? It would ruin my life. Like, think how weird people would start getting, asking you for money, and especially when you're a pastor, God told me, right, that you should give me $100,000. And I realized it would, my kids, imagine my kids going to school, like going to kindergarten, Suddenly their dad's worth $100 million, and the teachers and everybody going, oh, must be not, right? And all of a sudden, I'm laying in bed thinking about this, going, 
oh no, this would like ruin my life. I should throw that ticket out. You think I threw it out? No, I didn't. Remember, I do have a sinful nature, right? But I want you to think about that. Like, what amount of material goods would satisfy the longings of your soul for love, for joy, for peace, and all the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5? I know a lot of really, really rich people because I have some friends that live in Kikuyuula over there, and they have lots of really wealthy friends. These are people who have vacation homes that are worth $10, $10 million, right? Vacation. Their, their second home is worth $10 million. Do you think they're any happier or more full of joy or peace than you guys? They're not. <laughs> they're just not. They're great people. By the way, this is a totally aside, but in my life, I've like been in all kinds of different groups of people from like really gnarly like ghetto dwellers to like zillionaires, you know? And it's the funniest thing. A lot of people think all really super rich people are jerks, you know? It's, they're not. It's about the same ratio of jerks to cool people as poor people. I, it's it's kind of weird. Some people are super rich and super chill and super cool about it, and some people are totally what you would imagine a rich jerk to be like. Then you go hang out with poor people. Some poor people are really cool, and some poor people are real jerks. It's about the same. But look what God's telling us right here in this, right? What does it profit a man to become the most wealthy person on the planet and to lose your soul? Yeah? Nothing. Nothing. So he says, pick up your cross and die to yourself. And then the last verse today, or last two verses today, 26 and 27. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Um, by the way, um, the, uh, the Greek on this one is not really ashamed. The better translation from the Greek is this. If you reject Jesus, then you yourself become rejected. That's actually a better translation. So you know that whole, like, don't be ashamed of Jesus. And you ever get those, uh, you guys are probably too young, but when email first came out, that's how old I am. I remember the first email I got. Juno? Juno? What's that? Juno or no? Oh, no, I don't know what it was. I don't know, that's a good question. I don't remember what it was. I think it was Microsoft something or other, yeah. But when, e when Christians first got email, it was really embarrassing because you could see who finally got email for the first time because they would email you these stupid chain emails. Have you ever seen one of these? It's like, if you love Jesus, you will forward this email. Yeah, and they still do that? They do yeah. stuff like that? Like, is that just the stupidest thing in the world? If you really love Jesus, you'll forward this email. And if you're not, it's you're ashamed of Jesus. It, who... Who sends that kind of crap? Well, unfortunately, a lot of people. Like, I was always shocked that people would send these things to me. And I'd write back, like, you know, as your pastor, I'm going to ask you to think a day before you forward these chain emails. Or, or, like, if you send this email to 20 friends, God has to answer your prayer. Like, really? This is so... They did still do that? That is so stupid. Anyways. What's my point about this? Oh, people use that as like, people use that as if, you re if you're not ashamed of Jesus, then you'll insert whatever that thing is you'll do, right? Yeah. Scrap that. That's actually not what this verse says. It just says if you reject Christ, you will be rejected. Amen? Super simple, right? Okay, and then last thing, this last weird bit about um, the, some are standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Some people are like, oh, does that mean they weren't supposed to die? No. Um, you've heard my contention before, and I stand by it, that the kingdom of God starts at the cross when Jesus takes the sip of wine. Yeah? That is the ushering in of the kingdom of God. And at that point, he's going to die, and it's going to take a few days before the um, Holy Spirit down and dwells people, but at this point, the kingdom of God is set loose on the planet, and he's basically saying, and these guys, you guys will be here for that. Okay, so what do we have to say about all of this today? Um, well, let's see. Uh, I want to talk briefly about God's timing. Uh, Jesus seems to only want to reveal enough about himself that they can deal with with what's right in front of them. He gives them very brief ex explanation. Um, I will be, you know, I will be afflicted, suffered, killed. I will rise again on the third day, right? 
At that point, he's just going to let them kind of, you know, marinate on that for like a month or two or a few months or whatever, yeah? And so I would say it's kind of the same with us, only in reverse, yeah? First, Jesus reveals who he is to us, and then I think slowly over time, he begins to reveal what we're really like, and he reveals our sinful nature so that we can begin to deal with it, yeah? At least that's kind of what happened to me in my life. I got saved late in life, yeah? Okay? So that's God's timing. How he reveals himself to people is under his control and his timing. Um, what else was I going to tell you about that today? I thought I had all these great applications. Now they don't look so good. He looked really good when I was looking at him earlier, yeah? Yeah. Okay, well, let me, let me just briefly, oh, we're about out of time. Okay, let me give me one minute, and then I'll pause if you guys have any questions or comments on this. Um, but I love this idea about dying to self. Pick up your cross daily, right? Um, submission to God is a true humbling of self, recognizing that we need him, and to recognize that, even now, we are still prone to sin. However, when you truly understand that selfish, sinful life leads to death, then you put yourself under the authority of Christ to be led unto life. And you might not know this, but you know, when the Bible teaches about salvation, did you know it teaches about it in all three tenths? It says this in the Bible. It says you have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. So salvation is a process. Justification is a one-time event that guarantees your salvation. You repent of your sin. You ask Jesus to come into your heart or say the magic prayer or however, do an altar call. However, it works different for everybody. But at a certain point, you, are, you recognize Christ as your Savior. You have been justified. Then you get into salvation. It says you've been saved, but it also says you're being saved, and it says you will be saved. So this is the lifetime arc that you have to look ahead of you. You guys have a lot more time left than I do <laughs> to grow, to have power over your sinful nature, and to practice what Jesus just said, which is pick up your cross daily, deny yourself, don't be concerned with the things of the world, because all the things of the world cannot lead you to eternal life. Um, and there's a big difference between this, and I'll wrap up with this thought. There's a, there's a, uh, the point is, there's a difference between God loves me just the way I am, therefore I can do what I like, and God loves me, but he wants me to have a real life, so I got to give up the self and seek him. Does that make sense? God loves me just the way I am, but he loves me so much he doesn't want to leave me the way I am. He has much bigger plans for my life. Okay. Questions or comments with 30 seconds left? Yes, Nick. Um, why do you think they were super surprised when they heard about the resurrection of Jesus? When the three ideas, like when he was asking who did people say I am, John the Baptist, who was already dead. They're already dead, yeah. Elijah was already dead. One of the prophets come back to life. So all three of their suggestions were resurrection. But then they were surprised when Jesus came to It's a good question that I don't know we can answer from Scripture, but I have two speculations on that. Um, the first one is when he shows up resurrected, I just imagine it just kind of blew their minds. Like he shows up, first of all, he appears suddenly in the room. <laughs> so that's got to be weird enough. Remember, Jesus shows up with his resurrected body, and apparently the resurrected body can walk right through walls or just appear, right? And you guys sat through Hugh Ross, right? So you probably get that it's possible in the, if Jesus is in the 12th dimension, he can do that, right? But just the reality that he's back, I think, blew their minds. And number two, we always got to keep this in mind. They didn't yet have the Holy Spirit indwelling them to remind them of these things, um, to teach them these things, to bring these things to mind all the time. It is kind of interesting, though, how surprised they are by it. Kate? Well, later in verse, sorry, mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, let me tell you this. So how it works in the book of Matthew is three predictions. The first one, Peter says, not going to happen. And everybody's like, we're, we're not going to let it happen. You're not going to die, right? The second time, he predicts his death. 
there, it says they were full of sorrow. They were kind of bugged about it, right? And the third time he predicts his death is when they start arguing over who would be greatest. <laughs> All three responses really aren't exactly what he was looking for, I don't think, right? They really don't seem to wrap their heads around the fact that he's going to die and be resurrected. And they don't really seem to get it until he's actually resurrected. Then 40 days later, they get the Holy Spirit, and then everything seems to sink in, and then they go out, and now they're ready to go tell the world about the gospel, because now they know the whole gospel. Think about it. The gospel's only halfway there with the crucifixion, right? Yeah, with the crucifixion, there's really no hope. It's in the resurrection of Christ that we are brought back to life, basically, according to Romans chapter 6, right? So it's the... They, they can't be again evangelizing until they get the whole story and the indwelling Holy Spirit that they can now go out and tell the story. Okay, we're kind of out of time. Is that it? Everybody good? Everybody good? Okay, hey, uh, Friday's going to be kind of fun. We're going to do the um, Transfiguration of Christ to the Mount of Transfiguration, which once again, Peter sticks his foot in his mouth again. But it's kind of a wacky scene up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's some kind of wacky, cool science fiction stuff going on there that I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys that's going to make you kind of go, whoa, I think. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Pray for a good dinner in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.